What is that like, being in South Central Los Angeles, selling the concept of the Almighty? The hardest thing in the world to sell is, is religion. I can't even get my <laughs> head around that. People spend money on the stupidest things. Yes, quickly. what we call retail therapy. There you go, retail yeah. therapy. Yeah, but very quickly, you know, your, your happiness levels go back to a normal level. Your body adapts, and you're not any happier than you were before. Like, if you had sacred money, what would you spend it on? And it really got people to think about, like, intentionally think about things that bring happiness in their life. Okay, I, I, I need to, because yeah. first of all, I have chills. Yeah. Nobody cares about your company. Nobody cares about your mission, vision, and values unless you care about theirs. From the Demo Stack Studios in Scottsdale, Arizona, this is Go to Market This Week. Very excited this week on Go to Market This Week, having Travis Ashby, the co founder of Work Life, actually in studio. And we're going to take your business and just rip it apart today, Travis. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I love it. Let's do it. Is it easy being a founder? Travis, and I can ask you that because you've actually founded businesses before. I'll get into that in a second, but is it easy being a founder? Oh, it's definitely not easy, right? But it's fun. Like, I love it. I, I wouldn't be doing anything else. Like, I, I love building. I love creating. And it's just uh, something I have a passion for. So it's tough. It's like a roller coaster. It, it is a roller coaster, and we get that a lot. And what I think is interesting is a lot of people, you know, talk to me about, hey, I want to start this business or I have this idea for a product or service. And it's one thing to have this great idea, but in my career, I found that so many times I've been the translator for someone who has this great technical idea. But your background before you got into founding companies was in sales. I'm assuming that's a benefit to being a founder. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I always tell salespeople, if you can sell, why, why are you making somebody else rich? You know, a lot of times, you know, go out and find something you're passionate about and, and go sell that. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of inherent advantages for sure being in sales. You've had a really interesting career. You were in sales. You started a bunch of companies, probably the best known company you co-founded and were the CRO of Spiff. Where did, where did that idea come from? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Spiff was actually, um, when I had the idea for what I'm doing now, I actually went and talked with a few of my friends. I'd never actually started a tech company before. And so I wanted to kind of understand, you know, what I needed to understand and learn before I could launch what I was really passionate about. And so Jared and Paul, one of my good friends, uh, you know, I went and just spoke with him about what I was working on and, and it was kind of in the sales incentive, uh, you know, space and it was just sharing with him my idea and just telling him, yeah, I need to get some experience. I've got kind of like a four year plan to launch this. And he's like, well, dude, I've got this idea called Spiff. It's commission automation. And my commissions had always been wrong. You know, when I was Pepsi or Coke, like I was always the sales rep that was like calculating every, like, you know, every piece of the commission, Pay me what I'm yeah, owed. getting it right. And it was always wrong. I was always finding money in the cracks. And I was always telling the reps, you guys need to check your commissions. And like, ah, I don't have time for that. And, and so I, so it hit a pain point that I was passionate about. And, uh, he said, you know, come join me, come help me with the, you know, get this going and, uh, you know, come learn, you know, come learn from a lot of sales leaders. You're, you want to go into the, it's funny because Spiff actually doesn't do Spiffs. They actually do commissions and that, uh, you know, bring transparency and accuracy to commissions and things like that. And, and I actually wanted to do spiffs. And so it's kind of a funny thing. Maybe I'll convince Jaron to give me his name, but anyway, uh, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, so that's kind of the conversation. And so I was able to join the team there and, uh, kind of learn a lot from a lot of sales leaders for, for a little bit. And, uh, it was one step on the journey. So what was that like pivoting from, cause you were, you had a marketing company mm -hmm. before and now you pivoted into tech. Yeah. What was that step like? Yeah, it was different, right? Like, I mean, I had, I had a lot of experience in kind of uh, SMB sales, you know, direct sales uh, to small and medium-sized business owners. And so taking the leap into like more of an enterprise sale is a totally different ballgame. I mean, I, it was uh, like drinking out of a fire hose. It was, it was totally different. And uh, I definitely probably got a lot more out of the relationship uh, Spiff than they got from me, but I learned a lot and, uh, you know, and eventually brought in Andrew Gazdecki, who's just a legend. And, you know, he, he kind of replaced me when I, when I went to the next leg of my journey to launch the startup that I'm doing now at uh, Blue Board, which we can talk about later. It, it, was, it was great, but it was, uh, I didn't realize there was just such a kind of huge leap from what I had sold before to what, I, to what Spiff was selling. It's a bit of an adjustment. I've learned that myself. <laughs> yeah. So you're based in Salt Lake City. That's where work life is based out of... People don't realize Salt Lake City is actually considered one of the top. It's always on a list of the top 15 startup hubs in America. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, but it's on kind of the same level as like Philadelphia and Denver. Other than a really educated workforce and a great cost of living, unless you live in Park City, what are some of the advantages of like starting up? What's the startup community like with like Silicon Slopes and stuff in, in Salt Lake City? Yeah, you know, Utah has some inherent qualities that are kind of unique. One of them is sales. I mean, 
the hardest thing in the world to sell is, is religion, right? And, and you got a lot of these, these guys that go on these two-year missions. I, w- I was the white boy in South Central, you know, for two years, uh, Compton Watts and uh, Inglewood. So, um, you know, you just you learn to get a thick skin and, and uh, you know, and, and so I think you get a lot of people, you know, in Utah that are just like really great salespeople. So you got a lot of sales tech that comes out of Utah, a lot of MLMs too, unfortunately, but um, so, some are good, some aren't. But, uh, yeah, you know, I think it's also kind of a community, you know, it's, Utah's really interesting. There's, you know, kind of just like, I don't know, just like a family feel there. Like, everybody wants to help each other out, and there's a lot of support. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of, like, you know, when you're talking about a business idea and you're looking over your shoulder, make sure nobody's going to steal your idea behind you. It's, uh, right. there's not a lot of that. There's a lot of collaboration, I think. There's a lot to unpack with the fact that you sold religion in <laughs> South Central Los Angeles for, for two. What, I mean, I will always, when someone knocks on my yeah. door, I will always open the door and listen to the presentation because I respect someone, especially living here in Phoenix, that yeah, yeah. when you're knocking on the door every day. What is that like being in South Central Los Angeles, selling the concept of the Almighty? I mean, I can't even, I can't even get my head around that. <laughs> yeah, we could get into a lot of, a lot of fun stories there, but uh, it was awesome. Like they're amazing people, and uh, you know, it's it's really about serving and helping people. So I, I love the opportunity I had just to to meet people. I I just love people in general. I love meeting new people. I love hearing their stories, and so it was just awesome to kind of you know go down there and just like you know, it's it's obviously totally different than. What I what I grew up in, and and so it was it was kind of just fun to be in a totally different environment, and, and everybody was super cool. Like you know, the, yeah, I didn't I didn't I didn't actually run into a lot of you know, kind of crazy dangerous situations at all. It was actually really cool. Uh, Salt Lake too is an underrated city. People don't realize it's one of the most beautiful cities in America. It's actually I like it. It's like Canada. I feel like I'm in Canada, but with bigger <laughs> mountains, if that's actually possible. And what I love about it is that if you're in any Uber or any conversation, the first thing asked people ask is, "Do you ski?" So I got to ask you, Travis, do you ski? Of course, yeah, Alta. It's my place. They, they still discriminate against snowboarders. I don't know how they can get away with that, but they still do. It's just how do you discriminate against snowboarders? I don't know. They don't let them in. It's just really? for skiers. Yeah, Alta's just for skiers. So let's talk about work life. And I want to talk about, I think it's so interesting where these hypotheses come from. And then can you actually turn that into a business? But what I loved when you and I met at Saster last month was you told me the story of where your hypothesis came from. And I'm, I'm going to let you tell that, tell that. But the reason we're here today was because this story just caught my attention and you had me pulled in. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, maybe since we have some time, like if you don't care, do you care if I share the story before that started before? I, I love stories. Give me the, give me the start of before I went, story. Yeah, I went from like the six figure sales guy to like, you know, uh, but yeah. So for in 2007, uh, economy was crashing, small businesses, you know, were kind of going out of business and I was selling a product called superpages.com okay. online yellow page directory, yep. right? We still had yellow pages in the early 2000s. So surprisingly, but, uh, yeah, you know, I remember walking into this guy's, uh, office one day he was a heating and air guy. And I knew that he was going to cut all of his marketing except for a couple things. And I thought for sure I was getting cut. And so I walked in this guy's office and my competitor just had just left. I recognized the guy, another yellow page directory who was the kind of the uh, incumbent in the area. There's there like the, the telco, the phone book company. And so I thought, and they had a better product, honestly, I, I knew they did. And I thought for sure that's where he would go. And he says, he sits down with me and he's like, Hey, Travis, you know, I had to get rid of, you know, as you know, I had to get rid of all my marketing. I, I narrowed it down to two things. I'm going to do this thing called money mailer. I'm going to do superpages.com. So I was surprised and I said, okay, cool. Well, you know, how did you come up with that decision? And he's like, I hate working with that guy. I'm like, the guy who just left, the, you know, he's like, yeah, he's like, that guy's an idiot. I don't like working with them. And, and I remember just sitting there thinking like, that guy's got a better product than me. And, and this guy just told me a few minutes ago that if this doesn't work for him, he's going out of business. And I remember just like being, you know, just sitting there thinking, gosh, can I really sell something that I don't believe in? And, um, and so I asked him, I said, well, what if he has a better product than me and you're going to get more leads out of that? And he just said, I trust you. I trust you. You're not going to sell me something that's, that's not because if this doesn't work for me, yeah, I'll go out of business. And so it was right then I realized I can't sell something I don't believe in. And I remember going back to the office and uh, there was about 30 reps there and me and the other top rep, his name was Scott Linford. I just went to him and said, dude, we got to go start our own business. He's like, well, what are we going to do? I'm like, I have no idea. Let's figure it out. So we jumped on a computer. We were looking up franchise ideas. And it was like when spine, you know, the uh, sign spinners were kind of first coming out. We're like, maybe we'll do that. I don't know. And uh, anyways, uh, we were trying to figure it out. And then he came in the next morning. He's like, I know what we're going to do. Okay, well, what is it? He's like, call tracking numbers. We're going we're gonna to go and help these business owners. What we're going to do is put unique 
numbers in all of their ads, advertising, uh, online and in, in print, and be able to record the calls. There's, at the time, call recording wasn't a huge thing, and so it was kind of a new thing. So but we can record the calls. We can put numbers in all their advertising. We can see what works, see what doesn't work, get rid of the stuff that doesn't, do more of the stuff that does, and know the difference between it all. This is, like, perfect. And so, yeah, we ended up finding this third-party call tracking provider, and that's how we started our agency. And we, we both quit our jobs, um, and uh, everybody thought we were crazy because the economy was turning yeah. down. And, and we ended up making six-figure income for, and had one of the fastest-growing companies uh, in Utah for like uh, three, four years. And, and what we were able to do is just go to these business owners and say, look, you know, you have these call tracking numbers from these advertising companies, but they're, they're just spinning these numbers to benefit them. Like, why don't we take the power and the control back for you? We'll be the third party. Let's just track everything. And so... Great argument. Yeah. And so that's what we ended up doing. And that's how we kind of got Oozle started. And then what we found out was the best ROI was internet marketing done properly you know, through Google AdWords and stuff. And so we ended up creating an agency and, and Oozle Media was kind of born. And, and uh, in hindsight, I wish we would just focus on the software component and just, you know, lock down all these $250 a month contracts. And, but we ended up getting to web, you know, websites and, and uh, SEO and kind of digital marketing, social media management, all that stuff. So that's what the Oozle Media um, kind of journey was. And so in 2000, so now fast forward to your question that you asked me earlier, you know, how did I get into work life? So in 2015 on paper, everything looked great. My life looked great. The business was doing really well. We need to verticalize, and so we found economies and efficiencies, um, you know, to be able to like maybe even potentially get like a you know a good multiple from our business. And and uh, but but really at the end of the day, I just wasn't passionate about what I was doing. You know, I you know I think that maybe that started with like SEO. Like I I felt like Google's changing their algorithm all the time. I've got this guy that's been paying me you know however much a month, and now he's like, hey, where's my rankings? And they're just gone. And I started like feeling uncomfortable selling to people that I knew, and and uh, didn't like really trust that like. Maybe we can, you know, deliver on, you know, what I thought we should be able to deliver on. And so Scott and I both just kind of felt the need we needed to move on. And so we put a couple guys in charge for a couple of years so we didn't have to be handcuffed to the business when we sold it. And we were able to, like, sell the business in 2015. And then I spent two years just really trying to find my why. I, I think Simon Sinek ruined me. Like yeah, I that's I read fair. the book. I'm just like, oh, my gosh, what's my why? I, I have no idea. Gary Vaynerchuk ruined me. <laughs> But I, I, I thought about it a lot. I'm like, gosh, you know, like, what do I really want to do in the world? Like, what if I was going to make something, I wanted to make a difference. And I really felt this pull to have like an impact focused kind of startup. And, but I didn't really know exactly what I was passionate about, what legacy I was going to leave for my three boys, what, what I would give a TED talk on, you know, and for whatever reason, those things were really important to me. And so I spent two years trying to figure it out. And it was the most frustrating two years of my life. I just remember just, you know, just being really frustrated. And my wife's like, dude, you're blowing through all of our savings. You got to go get a job. <laughs> And so I kind of was figuring that out. And then one day I just went to lunch with a founder friend of mine. We, we were part of a group of 12 founders. We'd meet every month and be very vulnerable with each other. We, we created what we call our TRIPS goals, which was like temporal relationship, intellectual, spiritual, personal, whatever. We created these goals and then we'd always have like an accountability partner every month and just try to work towards goals. So this was the beginning thoughts for what I'm doing now. Uh, anyways, so I went to lunch with this guy and uh, I was just kind of unloading on him, my frustrations. And he started asking me questions like, well, how do you get inspiration? What are times in your life when you've been really inspired and what brought that on and just trying to help me out? And I ended up um, sharing with him some vulnerable things from my life, you know, as well as like a lot of inspirational things. And one of the things that I shared with him was when I was 12 years old, uh, my parents just got divorced. We had this idyllic life up until I was 11 and a half. And my mom found a pilot boyfriend, left my dad, and our world just got torn apart. You know, we ended up, uh, you know, then we got divorced. Me and my two sisters lived with my mom. And then on my birthday, when I was 12 years old, she was in a singing group flying to Colorado and the plane crashed in the mountains of Colorado. And, you know, I remember um, just after she died, um, I had some really cool experiences that I was sharing with this guy, inspirational experiences. And one of them was this dream I had about her, where I was on this mountainside. I remember climbing up over this boulder and, like, seeing this plane fuselage uh, on this mountainside and, and, and these people. And I ended up talking with my mom on this mountainside, and um, it was, like, this really cool experience. And I remember just, like, telling him, gosh, I feel like I'd know that place if I saw it. Like, you know, I've always wanted to go there. And he stopped me, and he's like, wait a minute why haven't you done that? Like, you're looking for inspiration for your new startup. You're why? Like, dude, plan that trip. Call your sisters before you leave this lunch meeting and go do that trip. You're never going to do it. And so I called my sisters before I left lunch and we planned this trip for August. I didn't even know where this plane crashed. I like had to look up the newspaper articles and I found this article of this guy named Steve Jewett. It was uh, snowshoeing in and, you know, showed the plane wreckage. And, and I ended up tracking this guy down and just a kind of a cool, fun side story. He, this was his first res- search and rescue back in 1990. And uh, he remembered it clearly because he actually had to, 
when he was out there snowshoeing in to see if there's any survivors, there was an avalanche that broke, and he had to get into the plane fuselage to survive oh, this. Wow. Uh, it was just this wild story. But anyway, long story short, he, he said, yeah, I totally know where this is at. I can help you out. So he, he helped us figure out where it was, and we planned this trip. And the day before we were going to leave on this trip, I was telling my sisters, um, you know, this idea I had. I, I remembered that her wallet had been returned to me after she died. And inside of her wallet was some money that I could never bring myself to spend because I considered it sacred money. Right. So I just held on to it for all these years and had it in a little picture frame uh, that I kept with me. And so I had this idea and it hit me like a, like a bolt of lightning. I said, Hey, did you guys know I've had this money from mom's wallet? Like, why don't we have mom pay for our dinner tonight? Why don't we take this money and have mom pay for our river rafting experience? And for three days I was on this trip with my sisters and I remember just being in total flow thinking about this idea of sacred money. Like if you had sacred money, what would you spend it on? And it really got people to think about, like, intentionally think about things that bring happiness in their life. Okay, I, I, I need to yeah. Because first of all, I have chills. Yeah. What was that like when you first got there with your sisters? And we ended up just, it was awesome. Like, we ended up just talking about, you know, my mom. Like, we ended up having this kind of this experience that we should have had a long time ago. You know, uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happened after the fact. But, um, yeah, just 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 being able to, like, hand that money uh, to this 16 year old, you know, that took it and being able to like hand that away. It was, it was actually really, really hard to do, but, um, it totally opened my mind up and I, I was able to like, just kind of pick my sister's brains on, on this kind of idea and, and get a lot of, uh, you know, just awesome ideas from them. But it was, it, it was a pretty awesome experience. Yeah. One that I'll never forget. So you've had the experience. Yeah. How did, how now do you have the hypothesis for work life? Yeah. How does this all tie together? So what happened is I have this, I still have chills by the way. No, like yeah. I really, I'm sitting here and my whole body is like on it. Yeah. You know, the first kind of aha for me, as I was thinking about this idea of sacred money and talking to my sisters at dinner about this, a concept, it was just kind of new and fresh. Um, you know, we went back to this place that we were staying at and I remember we started playing our favorite board game, started li- listening to our favorite music, which was John Denver. And I was just like, had just, everything was firing for me on this concept. And I started realizing like people spend money on the stupidest things. Yes. We've never had higher levels of depression and addiction and divisiveness, and this constant stream of negativity in the world. We've never been more affluent. There's clearly no correlation between affluence and happiness. And I, and I knew this and a lot of us do, but I ended up just like researching all the science on happiness. Like I started just being on my computer, just searching stuff up and showing my sisters. And there's this funny picture of me and my two sisters where I was just in the zone on my computer and, and they like snapped a picture of, uh, so I, you know, sometimes I show that picture, but uh, they just like saw that I was just in the flow and just were letting me roll. And then um, I just started like looking at a lot of this science. Like for example, you know, hedonic adaptation. Like if you buy something, let's call it golf clubs or a car, your, your happiness levels will spike. Retail, very quickly. What we call retail therapy. There you go. Retail yeah. therapy. Yeah, but very quickly, you know, your, your happiness levels go back to a normal level. Your body adapts and you're not any happier than you were before. But if right. you have a peak experience, especially for me, like building up to that experience, like finding that guy, Steve Jewett, like planning this trip, like there was all this, you know, happiness, kind of anticipation happiness wow. that was real. And then I went on the trip and then there's long-term after effect. I realized, oh my gosh, like, why well, don't I we just help people like unlock peak experiences. And that was my initial idea was I called it 401 play. It was like 401k for experiences. And, and I, and I thought, gosh, why don't we just like do this? And then, and then it evolved from there, but that was the initial kind of, uh, idea on that. Can you just pause? I'm just going to buy 401 play.com on GoDaddy. Give me a sec. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out there's somebody that already owned it and uh, they were looking to sell it. And so we actually went through the process of potentially buying it. And then, uh, and then the idea evolved to something a little bit more concrete. That was, I knew how hard it was to find your why and to find your, yes. your, your mission that I didn't want to screw this up. And so that's why I actually went back and talked with Jaron Paul and a few of my founder friends that, look, I've never started a tech company. This is maybe something I want to ride into the sunset. I'm very passionate about this. Like the, We're solving the number one problem in the world. There's not a problem that's more important than, than happiness. There's an unhappiness epidemic. People are lonely. People are frustrated. There's so much negativity in the world. I'm like, gosh, why don't we just be the best in the world inspiring people to set and achieve very meaningful dreams and goals that they have and then have the company come along and help them get further faster towards things that they actually give a shit about. And so I, and I researched it. I couldn't find any software, any software that gave managers or companies any insight into the things that people actually cared about that could actually make a difference in their life. And so what I wanted to do is like gather up all the science on happiness, proven ways to be happier, put this into something I call the inspiration engine and be able to be the best in the world at inspiring people to be able to know. Because like, I didn't consciously think I wanted to go on this trip. It was very subconscious. Like it took someone to pull out of me this idea that I'd always yep. had and be able to put on the calendar and an accountability partner to make sure that I wouldn't actually did it. And so I'm like, gosh, what, can we build that in software? Can we actually do that? And so that was kind of like the beginnings of this. Okay. So 
Let's move into work life now. Give me a 15 second overview of what work life does. And then we're going to get into actually taking this to market. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. So I call it employee inspiration software. What we want to do is be able to help people discover and achieve very meaningful work and life goals. We want to know their dreams. I want to get that in the software. And then what we want to do is be able to go to companies and say, Hey, why don't we help people get further faster towards things they actually care about? Let's create personalized incentives you know, meaningful uh, benefits and, and, and recognition that's individualized for, for people that, that matters and then align all those things. Like take the things the company wants, their goals, yep. and take people's dreams and, and personal goals and then be able to go like this and create alignment and so that like we can actually, you know, motivate people properly because the magic is in the middle when you find like, you know, where that kind of overlap is. So let's talk about that in layman's terms. Yeah. So, so what is that? I'm, I'm buying mm-hmm. work life. I'm a sales leader. I'm buying work life for my team. What, what are we actually doing with it? Yeah. So what we're doing is we're actually um, in the software, we're able to help them kind of identify uh, meaningful goals and dreams that they, they want to go accomplish. And then we actually create what's called a work life balance savings account. It's an actual savings account. Uh, separate savings account for every single employee. And we're able to be able to find different ways that they can get uh, the company to help fund uh, some of the goals that they have. And so uh, then we have, you know, just a card that you, when people create their funds, uh, and they, they eventually want to go, you know, book the trip or, you know, go get the better up coach or go write the book or whatever they want to go do. Uh, they then just like use the card virtual or, or physical card to go and like make it happen. So as opposed to spiffs, mm-hmm. no pun intended to our earlier discussion, but yeah. as opposed to spiffs where it's uh, Hey, here's a, a new TV or here's a thousand dollar Amazon mm-hmm. gift card. What you're actually doing is getting them to choose a longer, I want to write a book. Mm-hmm. So I need $10,000 to write the book. I need $10,000 for a publishing coach. So actually setting it up that whatever my true goal is, I can be incentivized via work to get there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started looking at all the problems with just current sales incentives. It hadn't changed forever. It's like, this is the same thing we've been doing forever. It's, it's the same thing cash, today. It's gift cards. It's it's swag and the stuff. It's it's dumb Cancun President's Club trips that, like, no one wants to go. I mean, who wants to go hang out with their coworkers in their swimming suits, you know, on a beach somewhere on a boost cruise? And then, like, your plus one certainly doesn't want to. It's just like, why are we still doing this? You know, like, what if this person's, like, big dream is to go to Korea because they've never met that side of their family and there's this huge why behind it. It's like, why aren't we just, like, helping personalizing this for them and helping them go through something they're really excited about? And so I just saw that there was a lot of, like, kind of issues with current incentive programs. So give me give me just one, it, uh, obviously not too personalized because these are personal, but give me an example of, like, one that you've heard of that someone really wanted to do X. Oh, man. Narrowing down to one is, like, finding your favorite child. Dude, I, it's so – it it really – no, it's amazing. It's unbelievable. When you sit down with a, a group of people, say 40 people, and we – and we have them come to the meeting with their meaningful goals and they start talking about things and getting emotional and I share my sacred money story and they share theirs. Like we're really storytellers. That's what we are. And we're helping surface things that are very meaningful to people. The sacred money concept really gets people to dive deep. And uh, there's so many stories, but almost every company we go to, there's always someone that's saving for the down payment of their first house. Right. Almost always. Right. There's always somebody that has this trip that's very meaningful uh, that they've never done. There's always someone that has some sort of passion that they've never pursued, writing a book or, or learning guitar or whatever. There's always relationships that people need to have that, that they've been ignoring. Like, you know, we have one guy that's just like, look, you know, you know, where it's like, you know, maybe he has some other thing that he thought would make him happy. And we dig in and we're like, dude, you've got like a 15 year old in your house who's going to be out of the house in three years. Yeah. That time's going to buy that fast. What are you doing to create memories that you can have for the rest of your life with your 15-year-old before they're gone? You'll regret it the rest of your life if you don't. And we get people to slow down and recenter and be able to think about, like, what really is going to bring me happiness? And uh, I think about Ian Koniak. He was, you know, like a sales. Ian's great. Yeah, you know, but, like, for him, you know, he's like, oh, I wanted the Maserati. I wanted to do this thing. And it's just like, no. At the end of the day, those things didn't bring him happiness. When he was able to finally think about things, you know, in terms of like the sacred money type stuff, then he was able to find a lot of meaning and happiness. And so that's what we are hoping to do uh, for, for, for salespeople. Okay. I love that. So the hypothesis for work life was that there's a better way to incentivize sales teams. That's that sales leaders are going to want, but at the same time, you're creating a, a more holistic motivation for the sellers. That's the hypothesis. Yeah. My, so my hypothesis is like, look, if all you have is a coin operated sales culture, it's, it's doomed to fail. If, if, if all you, if, if it's coin operate, the next company that offers more money, you know, your reps are just going to leave. So how do you intrinsically motivate people? And, you know, one of the things that I think about is like, you know, it's unrealistic that everyone's going to go find a job they're passionate about. Right. Everybody's going to be able to go find something they can sell their passion about. Or everybody can leave a six figure job and go start their own business. Like I did, like that's unrealistic. And so the big thing that I kind of looked at was like, gosh, how, what do boring companies do? Like most companies are boring. Most right. CEOs aren't super charismatic. Most, most companies don't have this really awesome, you know, mission. 
vision or, or you know, or, or um, you know, product that's really inspiring to people. So how do those companies have any chance uh, of really motivating people? And, and what I kind of hit on was like everyone wants to do inspired work. Everyone wants to, but companies had it backwards. What companies were doing is coming up with their, you know, coming up with this like whatever mission, you know, that people may or may not, you know, care about these values. And I'm like, nobody cares. Nobody cares about your company. Nobody cares about your mission, vision, and values unless you care about theirs. Why don't you start there? Why don't you actually bother to find out what is actually meaningful for people and reverse that and then have them define things that they care about that they want to work towards? And then you build everything around what they care about. Stop guessing. You have no idea what's meaningful to people. And this cash and gift cards and stuff, is just, it's, it's just old school. We've got to reverse the way we're thinking about this. And so that's kind of how I'm thinking about like, the future of incentives. It's got to be really helping people like find things that are going to bring them happiness and then align incentives around that. For example, if you're at end of Q4 and you've got like this, you know, goals company hit this number and it's like, okay, who are top reps? And you're like, here's our five reps. We're like, let's find out what the work-life goals are. And so maybe your top rep, Sarah, like she's got this, you know, Korea trip, uh, you know, and she's never met that side of our family before. Well, why not just be like, Hey, like Sarah, like we know that you can help us unlock this number. You know, it's probably going to be nights and weekends. It's going to be a grind for the next little bit. But if you help us like, Korea trips taken care of. We see that it's, you know you got like ten grand to go to unlock that trip. Like we're just going to pay for it if you if you help us. So now she goes home and talks to her, you know, her, her partner and her partner's like, hey, look, you know, I don't even want to see you for three weeks. Like, go make that happen for our family. Right. And so now you're taking what she cares about, what the company cares about, and you're creating going like this, and it's just way better than throwing just more money at a rep that's already made one hundred seventy five thousand. And you're like, oh, here's this ten thousand dollar accelerator. And it's just like there's a point of diminishing returns where throwing more money at someone. Right isn't going to move the needle. Like they're not going to go work nights and weekends to make a little bit extra cash. We're like, it's just psychologically, it's totally different to do things like what we're talking about. I love it. So sold. So I'm buying your hypothesis. What does that actually look like? So now you have the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now you're like, I'm ready. I'm starting a business. I have this plan. What's the first, I'm literally the first thing that you do once you have your business plan. Yeah. I I found that there was companies that were trying to, to go down the vein of what we are doing and, and failing miserably. Like, you know, there's these point system type rewards things, and there's all these different things going on. I'm like, this has to work. Like, it just has to change people's lives. It has to really change culture. And, um, you know, and I, and I really want to make sure that it worked. And so my number one thing was, why don't I go find people first, founders, sales leaders, and, and people people, um, and be able to bring them in early and, you know, we're aligned on the why, so we know we're trying to accomplish this thing and then be able to work in the trenches with uh, these initial companies just to figure it out, like really product focused, make sure that we get this done right. And so we had to raise some money, pre-seed round of funding from Surface Ventures, we got go-to-market fund, we've got a uh, uh, Fenton Founders Fund, um, Connected Ventures, we've got like 25 angel investors that are all like go-to-market leaders, and people that just really care, honestly, people that you would know, you know, your Scott Leases, Amy Volas, uh, Morgan Amor. Ingram, Katie Dorsey's of the world that really care about the future of sales. And so we thought, let's surround ourselves with these folks. Let's go find like-minded companies and leaders. And then let's just start building this thing. And let's make sure we get it right. And then once, you know, then we'll be able to like, you know, figure out where we want to go from there. So that's kind of where we started. Okay. I'm going to take you a step back because now you're talking about getting pre-seed money. So you're getting money. Yeah. Where do we even start with that? Where does that begin? If I don't know, if I haven't co-founded Spiff and I don't know where to start on that, I just have a really great idea. I'm willing to put 30,000 of my own money into building like a minimal viable product just to see if this is actually conceptually going to work. What do I do? What doors do I start knocking on? Yeah. You know, so, you know, there's different, um, you know, different types of investors out there, obviously. Um, Sometimes people, there's, there's always some new round of funding that some new name, but like, you know, friends and family round of funding, you know, uh, angel investors. And then, but, but pre-seed round is usually an idea, right? Like pre-product, pre-revenue, um, you can go find, um, funds that that's their thesis. Like they come in at that earliest level. And, and so you want to be, be knocking on those doors. You don't want to be spinning your wheels, talking to people that only, you know, do seed rounds or later. You just waste a bunch of time. So yeah, finding out all the pre-seed investors that are around your thesis. So I, we were f- future of work, future of sales, right? Like that's where we were at. And so we needed to like really hone in and, and, um, and, and find uh, investors where that was their thesis. And that's kind of the world that they operated in. And then just, we had hundred, you know, Met with over 100 investors, got turned down by almost all of them, and then found a few that, like... You just need one. Just need one. Just need one. And, and for, for me, I wanted to find, you know, investors also. Like, like life's too short, dude. Like, I'm just like, look, I'm not going to work with people that, you know, are like, hey, you got to exit this. I'm like, I might ride this in the sunset. Like, you got to... Like, had to be impact-focused and really care about people and what we were trying to do, like our overall mission. Um, and so, so it was hard, and we trudged through a lot, but we found, we found, we found the right people. So now you're doing a founder-led sale. Right. So you're reaching out to other sales yeah. leaders. You're making that sale. At what point do you realize that you have product market fit? 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think we found um, quickly that we had message market fit first. So I think that we found that like the message just resonated. I mean, I mean, and, and uh, you know, I think that we found that like, especially with sell, like we actually stumbled on the HR pitch for, for a while. Like we found that like, it was a very crowded space. You know, everybody's talking about well-being in their own way. Like, you know, and, and we, we kind of found that like, we weren't getting any traction there. And we realized like, gosh, HR is tough. Like it's, that's not where we should start. Like it's, you know, um, it takes forever to make decisions in HR. They never have any money. Like, you know, it's just longer sell cycle. And we were talking to the sellers and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm always trying to come up with a new spiff. I always have to come up with a new, you know, incentive is like, this is awesome. This is perfect. And we, we started realizing that was our go-to-market is sales was our beachhead. We were going to land there right? and we were going to like help people really personalize, incentivize, uh, um, uh, individualize, you know, incentives. And then, and then, and then we got introduced, introduced to like the HR side because we had to link up to payroll and stuff. And so we had a natural introduction. So we thought, okay, land and expand strategy. Let's, let's get in the door through sales. We'll expand, uh, you know, into HR and, and sales leaders are like, we want this yesterday. Like, you know, they, they had money, they had budget, they made quicker decisions. It was just a kind of obvious place for us to go. And, yeah. no, and nobody was planning in the space. Nobody was there on that side of it. The yeah, sales tech's great. It's great, great space to yeah. be in. If, you, if you've it. got a great message, if you've got a great argument. Okay, so now you've got product market fit. You're, are you still doing founder-led sales? Have you started, have you engaged uh, sellers for your team yet? Yeah, no, we haven't. So kind of where we're at is uh, we have like kind of a tight five-person team, um, uh, mostly engineers. And uh, John and I, he came from Blueboard. So he came from the recognition space, uh, spent seven years there at a really cool company called Blueboard and had a lot of experience there. And so he, he's come over. So him and I are the ones kind of selling right now. Now we're thinking about, you know, as we're getting ready to raise our seed round, now we're thinking about that, that whole question right. of, you know, how do we, how do we kind of go to market with this? And, and the way we're kind of thinking about that is, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of starting off, um, SMB s- similar to what I was familiar with, um, just finding at, at the founder level, like we really want our initial customers, probably first few hundred customers to, to, to really care about their people, like truly care about their right. people. Cause they're going to give us a pass when the product's ugly and we're figuring things out. Like it's just going to be better. And to build a, you know, a base of uh, customers that, you know, our SMB is, we just felt like it was going to be a smart way for us to go. And so, you know, we'll probably get the first couple hundred customers just from our own networks and things like that. And then uh, we'll raise the seed round here probably in January. And uh, I, I feel like with the customers that we have right now, uh, we're pretty close to kind of showing that we've got product market fit. And so we just need to put gas in the fire. And, and then, you know, um, that's where I'd probably like love, you know, to be able to hear from, you know, people like yourself or other people, like our advisors, we're going to be hitting up hard on, on exactly how we want to kind of like transition from founder led sales. Cause you know, I, I tell my story a lot. Right. So it's just like, okay, well, I'm not going to be there on those calls. Like how do we, and that's, what's tough, right? And actually tough. in a couple of weeks, we've got Wayne Morris from Morris yeah. consulting coming in to talk about exactly that yeah. going from a founder led sale to building a sales team. But let's, let's, let me strike that product market fit court again. You, you said you think you have product. How do you know if you have product? Yeah. The way that I know is, is if I can go talk to somebody and through the inspiration engine and the things that we're building, I can see that they were able to narrow in on something that was really meaningful for them and that they have that light in their eyes. They get that joy. They're like, Oh my gosh, like I, you know, the 15 year old example, right? Like I've got this trip planned to Japan. I'm going to go with my 15 year old. And, and I know if I look into the future five years from now, I'm going to be able to look back and, and, and that person is going to say, gosh, if it wasn't for work life in my company, I would have never done that thing. Right. I would have never gone on that trip. I've never deepened that relationship with my dad, whatever it was, I wouldn't have done it. That's how I know. And so it's going to be a while before maybe, maybe I know that maybe, maybe a year down the road, but like, I just need to make sure that, um, it's actually going to be able to do that. And I don't know if we can do it all in the software. Like I'm feeling like there's a human component to the, what we need to do. That's going to be really important. There's a book called the dream manager. It's kind of along the same sort of lines where it's just like, you know, I feel like there has to be someone that can help dig in on people and help do for them what my mentor did for me. We'll, we'll see how far the software can go with that, but we, we probably will need to like have a service component of that. Got it. The dream manager by Matthew Kelly, Matthew Kelly. Yeah. Awesome book. Yeah. If you read that, you'll, you'll get the gist of kind of where I want to go with that. So let's talk about that. You can tell your story and you're here because mm-hmm. you told me your story. It's faster. I'm like, you're coming to Phoenix. I got news for you. I got no choice. I'm bringing to Phoenix. How do you get John to tell your story? If John is now your boots on the ground, making those calls in those conversations. Yeah. It's Cause you can't tell your story, right? Cause there, there's the authentic authenticity of your own story mm-hmm. and your own pain points and your own, your own hero's journey. Yeah. So do you get Jonathan to, to come up with his own how does that work? I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, part of our go-to-market strategy is through partners and resellers, you know, like yep. sales coaches and, and uh, you know, HR 
consultants and things like that. And, and, I, and everybody has a story. So I think we'll want to make sure that people have like, you know, their own sacred money story. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to be really good storytellers. Like I, if I get in front of a conference of a thousand people and they're like, Hey, what's work life? You know, I, I want to be like, I could tell you, but I'd rather just show you. Yeah. And I want to show them that video. I want to capture that. And then I want to show them the video of the person at this company, at Qualtrics that did this thing. And the person over here that like built this relationship, the person over here that overcame addiction, you know, and, and was able to like, you know, overcome an obstacle that's preventing them from doing their best work and living their best life. And so, you know, I want to be able to tell those stories and find those stories and surface those in the company and, and, and be able to like, just be awesome storytellers. So we, we're going to be really amazing storytellers. We have to be for this to work. Well, I think it's going to work. And I think you're right though. You have to be great storytellers. Okay. So you got product market fit. You think we're getting the seed round. We're going to start building on a sales team. What are some of the other things that you're thinking about other than scaling up a sales team? How are you going to market this? What are the different channels you're going to use? Cause to me, I'm like, give me like three case studies of the person who went to meet their <laughs> other side of the family in Korea, send a videographer with them for three days. And to me, that's, I mean, that's it. That's done and dusted. Yeah, you're right. That's what we're doing is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the, probably the first kind of like dream manager, I guess, in the company. I want to be able to get in the dream weeds. Dream manager. Yeah. Dude, I want, I want to be able to get in the weeds with the ultimate end user. We're, we're like a B2B to C play, right? Like at the end of the day, what I want is everyone to have I'm a writing work, that down. Hold, a work on, life hold on, I'm writing account. that down. <laughs> but like, I, I feel like, you know, there's not a lot of loyalty in business. Right. right. Like people get fired all the time. People leave for whatever reason. And it's just like people are moving. And I feel like there needs to be like a third party that sits in the middle. That's kind of like the advocate between an employee and employer that can do for the company what they can't do for themselves, which is get very candid feedback from people about what's preventing them from doing their best work and living their best life. And so I feel like we have a very interesting uh, situation where we can come in as a third party and, and people can have work life and carry it with them in their tool belt through their entire career. So that when you do leave your company you're at and you go to the new company, I can go to that new company and say, Hey, you just hired Sarah. We've known her for five years. We know her big dreams. We yeah. know her goals. We know everything about her. Why don't you help me help you help her? And then they pay us, you know, $5 per employee per month. That's what we're charging right now. And, uh, and they link up to her public goals and she has public goals that the, you know, Sales leaders can build incentives around, the HR leaders can build, you know, benefits and recognition around, but then she might have private goals where she's like, I don't want my company to know that I'm struggling with addiction. Right. Not a lot of people want their company to know, nor are companies even built to be able to help people with those sorts of things. Like yeah, HR really, good point. they're not really built for that. And so it's like how, so what we could do is sit in the middle and, and I can go to the company and say, Hey, we have five people that are in the company. They're struggling with some serious mental health stuff. We need to help them. And maybe for every dollar they put in the work-life balance, the company puts in three and they match. And, and maybe we can unlock a pre-tax benefit on that. Like, these are all things that we're thinking about and like uh, you're building for, but I feel like we can create something that's a real lifeline for people that truly can be able to um, kind of bridge uh, what's broken right now out in the market. And so it's a very interesting and different type proposition. And so like we have like go to market, there's a couple plays, right? Like we've got the B2B play, but then I want to have 10,000 people with work-life accounts, you know, uh, by the end of next year, right? And so, or, or whatever. And, and so it's like, how do we build trust? How do we, people understand that our intentions are right? We're not trying to sell their data. Like we really want to know you and what you're trying to do and then be your advocate on your side to, to then, then encourage the company to help you. So there's a kind of a product led growth strategy, a bottoms yeah. up PLG strategy that's going to be really important for us. No question. To unlock. And, and, I, and that makes sense. And that was one of the places I was going to go. So, all right, I, I'm, I'm going to say you're a seller. I'm looking at your, your background, your resume, you're a seller. It's, it's a good question. It's something we're figuring out right now. Like we don't really know exactly, you know, how the best way to kind of move forward with that. And, and it's something that we're like just right in the middle of. To me, there's a out. huge social play. For and, sure. And, and I also think what you did was really smart. So you're part of the GTM fund mm -hmm. as is demo stack, yeah. which is I think part of how we got connected originally. And you know, when you tell me that you're leveraging people like Scott Lees and Amy Volas, and when you have advisors on that level who have social clout and social equity, there is a component mm -hmm. of social equity that you can, you can pull that lever. Yeah, you, you hit it right in the head. I mean, that's that is what it is. You know, we're gonna kind of be able to make sure that we've kind of holistically encapsulated like what this is at its heart and at its core. You know, uh, like truly, and then be able to you know have them help us say, hey, look, help us create the future of cells. You know, maybe there's a scenario where you know we go find those folks that want to like you know we build a company for the people by the people. Like maybe you know we raise the you know the uh, the new kind of crowdfunding that you can raise, you know, equity crowdfunding and, and, and have, uh, you know, sales leaders that are like, this is the future that I want to see in sales. I want to help create it. And then we go, you know, you can raise, I think up to 5 million a year on, uh, from non-accredited investors and things like that. And so those are all things that I'm kind of looking at and playing around with. Um, but I just want to make sure that we surround ourselves with people that, um, are just 
aligned on the why. And, you know, life's too short, right? It's just not you know, worth, you know, working with people that just are focused on themselves. And so it's really about finding the right team. Like there's a, there's a book that I read called Creativity Inc. And it was from the founders of Pixar, Ed Catmull and, and okay. Steve Jobs. And, and one of the things that I loved about that book uh, is they had all these movie ideas, you know, from Up to Monsters, Inc. to Cars to, you know, Toy Story. And they just had hit after hit after hit. And in this book, it kind of talks about what their success was all about. And it was really about creating this brain trust of people that are very passionate, very candid, you can sit in a room and kind of just like, ah, this just doesn't feel right. And they didn't have to have a solution at the time. They just had to like have people that cared. And so like they talked about in the book how, you know, the, the movie Up, I think it was originally about like these two kind of selfish uh, princes that were cast down to earth and whatever. It was totally different than what it ended up being. And um, they attributed all their success to this thing called the brain trust. And one of the ideas, one of the quotes from the book that I loved, it says, it said, you know, you can give, uh, you know, an, you know, like essentially an A plus idea to a mediocre team and they'll ruin it. You can give a mediocre <laughs> idea, idea. You can give a mediocre idea to an A plus team and they'll either right. fix it or come up with something better. Right. So for me at this point, at the stage that we're at, it's all about the team. It's all about having the right team. And so we usually will work with, even with my third co-founder, we worked with him for a few months uh, to make sure that there was alignment there. We're doing the same thing with our UX UI guy that we're working with right now. One of my old, uh, uh friends. And then, um, and then with the marketing kind of director we're talking to, we're just making sure that, um, we're all going to work well together. And then once we've got the, kind of the initial kind of A-plus team, and then I think that, uh, you know, we can take that seat around money and then be like, okay, how do we go find, like, true seekers of happiness? Like, th that's who we want to find is, you know. I th that's probably our only value that we have right now. I love it. And this is, like, very inspiring for me. Like, I'm, you know, I'm buying, you know, I get pitched every day. Yeah. I'm buying what you're selling. I can't give you a better compliment. So let me ask you this, yeah. Travis. What's, what's the next goal for you? I mean, other than building this great company, you know, if, I, if you're a seller right now, you're, you're just an AE at this company, yeah. what, what are you putting on your work-life card? What are you aiming for? Yeah, you know, for, for me, um, it's, it's, I, 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 there's the there's longest ongoing study on happiness. Um, it's the longest ongoing study, I think, that's out there, and it's on happiness. But they, felt, they followed a bunch of uh, folks from late 1940s. It was John F. Kennedy. It was a bunch of other people that was in the same kind of cohort at the college. They followed him through their lives and uh, specifically trying to see, like, um, what led to helping people live happier and longer lives. And, when, and so it's, it's still ongoing today. And the, the thing that they came, that they've kind of zeroed in on is all about your relationships. And it's not so much about quantities is about quality. Like the, the, the more and deeper relationships, you know, if you have deep, uh, strong relationships with, you know, you know, key people, like you're going to live longer and happier life. And so right. for me, it's about, you know, honing in on, um, you know, kind of helping people solve for their own like happiness equation, their own personal happiness equation. It's different for everybody. Right. And so I've kind of found mine. And, and for me, um, you know, for me, it's, it's definitely the relationships in my life. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work that I need to do on, you know, building a better relationship with my dad. You know, he's getting older. I'm just like, I, I don't spend time with my dad. Like I need to make sure I put on the calendar, you know, that we're going to go golfing once a right. month and then maybe my company will pay for it for the year. You know, it's just like little things that don't have to take a lot of money, but it is sacred time and it is sacred money. Um, and so like, there's things like that, that I'm trying to like figure out. And my, my co-founders laugh at me because I have like 12 goals in work life and they've got like three. Right. But <laughs> there's just, there's just a, a lot that I'm like, realizing, oh my gosh, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do this. And so I've got like all these goals in there that I want to, uh, you know, kind of start working towards. Uh, but I, I, I almost, I honestly, like, I, I love that I'm building this for myself because I need something like this. Like I need someone to hold me accountable. I need to be able to have something yeah. on the calendar, be setting aside money for it. Cause I just, I'm, I'm too scatterbrained. Like I'll just, I'll just space stuff off. So I get it. And I think what's really interesting, like I've been doing a deep dive for like 10 minutes in my own head of like, what would I use mm -hmm. it for? Right. And I think the fact that I'm just going through the exercise period, I think is what's interesting to me. I mean, there's a stickiness to that because it's making me wonder, you know, what is passing me by? And you know, I have a 12 year old daughter. I'm yeah. very engaged in her mm -hmm. life, but am I, am I doing it? Should I take her on another trip yeah. or, you know, not that that's where, where I'm going with this, but I think it's, you, you pose an interesting question and I think that might be the stickiest thing about this is that you're going to make people think. And the reality is, is that most tech tools don't do that. Yeah. No, I think so. There, there's this idea I have, I call it your tapestry. So think of like a tapestry, you know, mm -hmm. on your wall next to you is like this tapestry of your life. And on this tapestry is images that represent the things that brought you the most happiness. So like, if you learn a guitar, like right now, one of my goals was to learn guitar with my 15 year old. Uh, I found out that he wanted to do that. And, and I'm like, I've always wanted to learn a guitar. Well, why don't I spend three years, of, you know, learning guitar with my son? And so we bought a guitar, first purchase, work-life purchase, and, uh, and got this app where it's gamified and we're like learning guitar and competing with each other and having a lot of fun. I could tell him this right. is what that means. You know, the other thing 
thing is like this, you know, obstacle that I overcame that was preventing me from doing my best work and, and living my best life. And, and so, you know, what I, what I take people through is this kind of imagery exercise where it's like, you know, what, what, what's on there, what needs to be on there before it's all said and done, uh, you know, and help them create this, this tapestry because it's, you know, your tapestry based around, you know, happiness goals. And then, uh, you know, and so we're going to, you know, our goal is to probably launch a podcast. You talk to, go to market. Like one of the things that we're going to do is launch a happiness hacker podcast and uh, be able to have people on and have them share their happiness hacks, like things that they uncover, you know, like your Ian Koniak's come on and say, hey, right. what did you hit on? that brought you happiness and that's where people are going to get their ideas within work life right. like they're going to be able to see this content from other people and say oh my gosh that's such a cool idea i'm going to actually take that goal i'm going to borrow that and i'm going to have that be my work life goal because we were shocked like nick we were so surprised how many people have no idea what like i mean what, what their dreams or meaningful goals are like so many people don't know right. they need help like surfacing that and so we found that that was going to be really really important for us is to be able to help people do that. And, and a lot of that comes from just hearing out what other people are doing and what they've learned and be able to share those like, you know, 15 minute kind of, uh, happiness hacks that they've kind of uncovered in their life. Well, I love it. You've built a super fan over here. Travis, where can we find everything about work life? Yeah, right. And we've been kind of, uh, under the radar a little bit, um, stealth mode a little, a little, but, uh, work life, uh, with a Y, uh, work life.io is, is the website and uh, any, anybody that's interested in, you know, potentially being part of our kind of initial beta cohort, um, probably kind of wrap that up here soon. But if, if they were interested, they could just go, uh, you know, there's a button on there that just says, you know, interested in the beta site, so you know, reach out and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll connect. But yeah, any, any kind of like people first, you know, founders or sales leaders or, or people, people, or, or even AEs that just, you know, kind of buy into this and, and want to be part of maybe like a initial cohort of kind of just end users at the end of the day, this has to work for you. Right. And, and that'll be free accounts for, for, for AEs and stuff. Um, you know, they can just come hit us up from the website. Worklife.io, L Y F E.io. Travis, thanks for joining us today. Have a safe trip back to uh, Salt Lake. And if you're coming through Phoenix, hit me up. I'll pick you up at the airport. We'll do one of these. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, everybody.